Good morning, Dollheads, and happy Hot Cross Bun Day. One of my, I would say it's my favourite day of the year. I've got I've got several favourite days, but I, I do like Good Friday. Try and scoff as many Hot Cross Buns as I can. Got down to the bakery yesterday. There wasn't even a queue. Happy, happy days. So, part two of George's Marvellous Medicine. So, last time we met George's horrible grandma, and he decided that he's going to have to teach her a lesson by replacing her medicine with something he's made himself, which is obviously something very dangerous and you shouldn't do at home. But it is quite funny in this book. And uh, let's see how he gets on. Okay, this chapter is called George Begins to Make the Medicine. Kind of does what it says in the tin, really. George took an enormous saucepan out of the cupboard and placed it on the kitchen table. George? came the shrill voice from the next room. What are you doing? Nothing, Grandma, he called out. You needn't think I can't hear you just because you closed the door. You're rattling the saucepans. Oh, I'm just tidying the kitchen, Grandma. Then there was silence. George had absolutely no doubts whatsoever about how he was going to make his famous medicine. He wasn't going to fool about wondering whether to put in a little bit of this or a little bit of that. Quite simply, he was going to put in everything he could find. There'd be no messing about, no hesitating, no wondering whether a particular thing would knock the old girl sideways or not. The rule would be this. Whatever he saw, if it was runny or powdery or gooey, it went in. Nobody had ever made a medicine like that before. If it didn't actually cure Grandma, then it would anyway cause some exciting results. It would be worth watching. George decided to work his way round the various rooms one at a time and see what they had to offer. He would go first to the bathroom. There are always lots of funny things in the bathroom. So upstairs he went, carrying the enormous two-handled saucepan before him. In the bathroom, he gazed longingly at the famous and dreaded medicine cupboard. But he didn't go near it. It was the only thing in the entire house he was forbidden to touch. He had made solemn promises to his parents about this, and he wasn't going to break them. There were things in there, they had told him, that could actually kill a person. And although he was out to give Grandma a pretty fiery mouthful, he didn't really want a dead body on his hands. George put the saucepan on the floor and went to work. Number one was a bottle labelled Golden Gloss Hair Shampoo. He emptied it into the pan. That ought to wash her tummy nice and clean, he said. He took a full tube of toothpaste and squeezed out the whole lot of it in one long worm. Maybe that will brighten up those horrid brown teeth of hers, he said. There was an aerosol can of super foam shaving soap belonging to his father. George loved playing with aerosols. He pressed the button and kept his finger on it until there was nothing left. A wonderful mountain of white foam built up in the giant saucepan. With his fingers, he scooped out the contents of a jar of vitamin-enriched face cream. In went a small bottle of scarlet nail varnish. If the toothpaste doesn't clear her teeth, George said, then this will paint them as red as roses. He found another jar of creamy stuff labelled hair remover. Smear it on your legs, it said, and allow to remain for five minutes. George tipped it all into the saucepan. There was a bottle with yellow stuff inside it called Dishworth's Famous Dandruff Cure. In it went. There was something called Brilliant for cleaning false teeth. It was a white powder. In that went too. He found another aerosol can. Nevermore ponking deodorant spray. Guaranteed, it said, to keep away unpleasant body smells for a whole day. She could use plenty of that, George said, as he sprayed the entire canful into the saucepan. Liquid paraffin, the next one was called. It was a big bottle. He hadn't the faintest idea what it did to you, but he poured it in anyway. That, he thought, looking around him, was about all from the bathroom. On his mother's dressing table in the bedroom, George found yet another lovely aerosol can. It was called Helga's Hair Set. Hold 12 inches away from the hair and spray lightly. He squirted the whole lot into the saucepan. He did enjoy squirting those aerosols. There was a bottle of perfume called Flowers of Turnips. It smelled of old cheese. In it went. And in too went a large round box of powder. It was called Pink Plaster. There was a powder puff on top, and he threw that in as well for good luck. 
found a couple of lipsticks. He pulled the greasy red things out of their little cases and added them to the mixture. The bedroom had nothing more to offer, so George carried the enormous saucepan downstairs again and trotted into the laundry room, where the shelves were full of all kinds of household items. The first one he took down was a large box of super white for automatic washing machines. Dirt, it said, will disappear like magic. George didn't know whether Grandma was automatic or not, but she was certainly a dirty old woman. So she better have it all, he said, tipping in the whole box full. Then there was a big tin of Waxwell floor polish. It removes filth and foul messes from your floor and leaves everything shiny bright, he said. George scooped the orange-coloured waxy stuff out of the tin and plonked it into the pan. There was a round cardboard carton labelled flea powder for dogs. Keep well away from the dog's food, it said, because this powder, if eaten, will make the dog explode. Good, said George, pouring it all into the saucepan. He found a box of canary seed on the shelf. Perhaps it'll make the old birds sing, he said, and in it went. Next, George explored the box with shoe cleaning materials, brushes and tins and dusters. Well now, he thought, Grandma's medicine is brown, so my medicine must also be brown or she'll smell a rat. The way to colour it, he decided, would be with brown shoe polish. The large tin he chose was labelled dark tan. Splendid! He scooped it all out with an old spoon and plopped it into the pan. He'd stir it up later. On his way back to the kitchen, George saw a bottle of gin standing on the sideboard. Grandma was very fond of gin. She was allowed to have a small nip of it every evening. Now he'd give her a treat. He'd pour the whole bottle in. He did. Back in the kitchen, George put the huge saucepan on the table and went over to the cupboard that served as a larder. The shelves were bulging with bottles and jars of every sort. He chose the following and emptied them one by one into the saucepan. A tin of curry powder, a tin of mustard powder, a bottle of extra hot chilli sauce, a tin of black peppercorns, a bottle of horseradish sauce. There, he said aloud, that should do it. George, came the screechy voice from the next room. Who are you talking to in there? What are you up to? Nothing, Grandma. Absolutely nothing, he called back. Is it time for my medicine yet? No, Grandma, not for about half an hour. Well, just you see, I don't forget it. You don't forget it. <laughs> I won't, Grandma, George answered. I promise I won't. This chapter is called Animal Pills. At this point, George suddenly had an extra good wheeze. Although the medicine cupboard in the house was forbidden ground, what about the medicines his father kept on the shelf in the shed next to the hen house? The animal medicines. What about those? Nobody had ever told him he mustn't touch them. Let's face it, George said to himself. Hairspray and shaving cream and shoe polish are all very well, and they will no doubt cause some splendid explosions inside the old geezer. But what the magic mixture now needs is a touch of the real stuff, real pills and real tonics to give it punch and muscle. George picked up the three quarters full saucepan and carried it out of the back door. He crossed the farmyard and headed straight for the shed alongside the hen house. He knew his father wouldn't be there. He was out haymaking in one of the meadows. George entered the dusty old shed and put the saucepan on the bench. Then he looked up at the medicine shelf. There were five big bottles there. Two were full of pills. Two were full of runny stuff. One was full of powder. I'll use them all, George said. Grandma needs them. Boy, does she need them. The first bottle he took down contained an orange coloured powder. The label said, for chickens with foul pest, hen gripe, sore beaks, gammy legs, coccolitis, egg trouble, broodiness or loss of feathers. Mix one spoonful only with each bucket of feed. Well, said George aloud to himself as he tipped in the whole bottle full. The old bird won't be losing any feathers after she's had a dose of this. The next bottle he took down had about 500 gigantic purple pills in it. For horses with horse throats, it said on the label. The horse-throated horse 
should suck one pill twice a day. Grandma may not have a hoarse throat, George said, but she's certainly got a sharp tongue. Maybe they'll cure that instead. Into the saucepan went the 500 gigantic purple pills. Then there was a bottle of thick yellowish liquid. For cows, bulls and bullocks, the label said. It will cure cowpox, cow mange, crumpled horns, bad breath in bulls, earache, toothache, headache, hoofache, tailache and sore udders. That grumpy old cow in the living room has every one of those rotten illnesses, George said. She'll need it all. With a slop and a gurgle, the yellow liquid splashed into the now nearly full saucepan. The next bottle contained a brilliant red liquid. Sheep dip, it said on the label. For sheep with sheep rot and for getting rid of ticks and fleas. Mix one spoonful in one gallon of water and slosh it over the sheep. Caution, do not make the mixture any stronger or the wool will fall out and the animal will be naked. By gum, said George. How I'd love to walk in and slosh it over old grandma and watch the ticks and fleas go jumping off her. But I can't. I mustn't. So she'll have to drink it instead. He poured the bright red medicine into the saucepan. The last bottle on the shelf was full of pale green pills. Pig pills, the label announced. For pigs with pork prickles, tender trotters, bristle blight and swine sickness. Give one pill per day. In severe cases, two pills may be given, but more than that will make the pig rock and roll. Just the stuff, said George, for that miserable old pig back there in the house. She'll need a very big dose. He tipped all the green pills, hundreds and hundreds of them, into the saucepan. There was an old stick lying on the bench that had been used for stirring paint. George picked it up and started to stir his marvellous concoction. The mixture was as thick as cream. As he stirred and stirred, many wonderful colours rose up from the depths and blended together. Pinks, blues, greens, yellows and browns. George went on stirring until it was all well mixed. But even so, there were still hundreds of pills lying on the bottom that hadn't melted. And there was his mother's splendid powder puff floating on the surface. Mm, I shall have to boil it all up, George said. One good quick boil on the stove is all it needs. And with that, he staggered back towards the house with the enormous heavy saucepan. On the way, he passed the garage, so he went in to see if he could find any other interesting things. He added the following. Half a point of engine oil. Half a pint of engine oil to keep grandma's engine going smoothly. Some antifreeze to keep her radiator from freezing up in the winter. A handful of grease to grease her creaking joints. Then back to the kitchen. Oh, what's going to happen in there? I mean, presumably he's going to heat up his medicine. Then what's going to happen after that? Well, find out tomorrow. I'll see you at eight o'clock. And enjoy your hot cross buns. I know I will. Bye.